Hello there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Today we're going to talk about fish stalking. As a technique, stalking was specifically devised to catch big still water trout from small gin clear lakes when competition between the main players at the time, such as Abington and Diva Springs, saw them regularly going head to head in trying to stock the biggest brown and rainbow trout it was possible to produce. Amongst those early practitioners was Hampshire big fish angler Graham Pullen, who joins us here now. For many years, and most recently with the video cameras running for this website, Graham has used this technique to great effect. Stalking's a technique, you're just going to, I think, you're not going to be pursuing somebody uh, through a block of flats at, in the dark of night with a torch. Stalking, as we know it in the fishing terms, is creeping and crawling and trying to minimise your body language, your body movements, your arm waving, to creep up and put yourself in the position to cast a fly to a trout and give yourself the best shot of catching it. However, how can I qualify that? It makes it sound as though the trout is really, really crafty, careful fish. In fact, you know, my opinion is the trout are incredibly stupid. Most of the rules, i.e. you can only use dry fly certain times of the year on the river, it must be cast upstream, it can't be cast downstream, you can't use a, a sinking nymph, you can't do this, you can't do that, or size of flies. Those rules are all there, not for the entertainment of the angler, it's to protect the fish from the angler, because they are pretty dumb fish. The trout, remember, are fed in a stew pond all of their life. They know nothing but stew ponds. They're grown on from an egg. They're fed on dust, basically, of uh, uh, dust feed to start with. Gravy up the pellet size. A fish gets bigger. It's crammed and crammed with food. It's used to a man coming up, standing on the edge of the uh, of the stock pond. It's got 5,000 other fish around him. The man feeds them, what do you do? You rush and you eat the first thing that falls in the water, because if you don't, the other 4,999 trout will beat you to it and you'll die of starvation. So, when you stock a trout into a lake or a river, the first thing is going to be, it's starving hungry, it's got no natural predation there at all, because you've already taken that away by a man feeding it. It doesn't have to hunt for anything. It doesn't have birds, herons, etc. It doesn't have pike. It doesn't have other predators. And all of a sudden, along comes a man. And if he puts some sweet corn or some maggots or a bunch of worms on there, like the old poachers used to use years ago, obviously they're going to eat whatever's in front of them. They've got no idea that man is a predator. So the rules, as far as I can see, in fly fishing are there to make it different. It's a bit like, I see it like a like a golf course where they put a par on it, you know. If you said, you know, let's just go around the golf course and knock the ball down the hall, that's fine. But it's like somebody saying, well, look, there's a golf course. We don't know where the flag is. We don't know where the hole is. You've got to go batting the ball around. You don't really know what you're doing. So that's how I see the trout. You know, they're pretty dumb creatures and the rules are there to protect them. In a nutshell, then, stalking is a still water technique whereby individual fish, and presumably big fish, can be located and specifically targeted to the exclusion of other smaller fish in the same lake. Yeah, see, when you stop the trout in uh, in lakes and rivers, if they're left alone, they would settle down and start to feed on natural insect life, small fish or whatever, but they've been pumped up on steroids, if you like, so there's no way that any system, in southern England certainly, can maintain that growth rate that they've got, they're going to use all their body reserves, their body fat, they're going to go back in in, in, in weight because they're not fed these high-protein pellets and they're stocked into a lake. When you get them stocked into the lakes, as a, for, uh, as a for example, because river fishing, even though they're stocked, is pretty much what we call dead men's shoes. You know, it's difficult to get on stretches of uh, good trout rivers like the Test and the Itch, and there's a few day ticket spots you can fish, but the majority for Joe Public fishing is a day ticket on a still water, i.e. small stock lakes and stock ponds, and this is where the stalking comes into its own. Basically the fish are put into the into the lake and a good angler was always always out fish a, a bad angler. And the art of stalking really is is not in catch, catching a lot of trout, it's in catching the size trout that you want to catch. To be honest, they're not really difficult to catch. You know, once you've sort of developed a technique, uh, you want to catch fish. So you catch two pounders, then you catch three pounders. It's all very exciting. Then you catch four pounders. And the next thing you know, you're looking, ah, oh, what well, I want a double figure fish. But what you've got to realize is the fish farmer, or rather the actually fishery owner who either grows his own fish or he, he produces his own fish, or maybe he buys them in, 
It's a business to him. He has to buy those trout in. He cannot possibly afford to let all anglers catch four fish a day of ten pounds in weight. The ticket prices of twenty, thirty, forty, fifty pounds have all been creeping up. So there's a limit as to how many big fish he caught you can put in there. You can only put so many small fish, so many medium fish, and so many big fish. So there's very, very few large trout in a lake at any one time. Of course, you can't do this in all the still waters. It's, you can't generalise it, because to be able to stalk a fish individually and look for one big single fish, you need water clarity. That's going to limit you hugely, because a lot of the small uh, ponds, lakes, that are stock these fish, they've got a tinge of colour in them. They might actually be coloured, depending whether they're clay-based, whether they've got a, a head of coarse fish in there, whether they're spring-fed. You know, there's lots of different pointers as to what's going to make that a good stalking water, but basically the best ones are gin clear water. It enables you to see the size of fish you want to target. So it's good practice to start on, say, two-pound fish, three-pound fish, and, like, develop your technique. But once you get to the really bigger ones, you get so few, say, say there's three lakes, there might be one or two doubles in each lake. They might be bigger, but on average, there might be one or two doubles in each lake. There might be 50 other fish in there that want to rush and grab your fly. You have to learn to be patient and obviously a bit frustrating, but you've got to walk past maybe a four pounder to try and get to the bigger fish. And that's what you need the water clarity for. Then you've got to develop your actual stalking technique of approaching the trout, how you're going to present the fly, what fly, sinking rates. I mean, it's a sort of a minefield, but there is, there is a success rate enjoyed by the very good stalking anglers that gets them the big fish over Joe Average. There's no question of that. You know, good stalkers would always outfish, even good casters. Believe me, stalking has absolutely nothing to do with casting, long-distance casting whatsoever. So when you've actually spotted the big fish, let's say it's, it's 10 pounds, because double figures is, is, is the uh, benchmark by which most people sort of judge their stalking ability. You've got, as I've found in my experience, two sort of planes to catch those fish in. One is what I call the horizontal plane which would be a fish out towards the centre of a lake or within casting distance that you want to present the fly to. And you're going to put that fly across the front of that fish, but about, say, six feet in front of it. Whether it's static or moving, you need to be about six to eight feet in front of it and allow for it to sink to what you think, or you're going to guess at, is the depth that fish is basically holding station at. Remember, it's clear water, so it's very deceptive, the depth of that water. The fish may well be larger than 10 pounds that you think it is it may also and probably will be a lot deeper than it looks you know as you're seeing it through polarizing glasses now when your fly is sinking what you've got to do is judge by doing it close to the bank first just lowering the fly in the water and, and sort of guessing count what we call countdown technique the the sinking speed of that nymph because it's invariably going to be a weighted nymph that you use you know, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, 0. OK, you know, that might be 3 feet, 2 feet deep, something like that. Work your own scale out. So when you present that nymph in front of the trout, you can be counting down to your estimated depth before you start retrieving it, because you need to take it away. You don't want it to keep going to the bottom. You want to start taking it away. When you take it away, the fly will automatically lift up on the on the floating line you've got on the leader and start coming in a curve away from the trout, not straight up and down, but on a sort of horizontal plane. That's why I call it the horizontal plane method. And that you can stop and start. If you stop, the fly starts to sink again. If you keep tweaking it away from the trout, waiting for some response or a take from it, then it's bringing it higher in the water. But there is another method that you're going to use. Um, well, we just call it jiggling or vertical fishing. That's when you get fish that have settled down, that have been spooked by anglers. They're around the edge of the fisheries under bushes, under overhanging trees, they're like anywhere with a sort of bit of shade over their head, close into bays or, or, or points on the land, you know, where there's a, a few rushes or something like that. And they're going to be laying there where you can't even cast to these fish, they're so close to you. You need to spot them with the glasses first. Once you've spotted them, again, you're going to visually be able to see how fast that fly is sinking in relation to the depth of the trout. So you use whatever size you want to get down as quickly as you can to the trout, and, and you're going to try and stop this fly on the same horizontal plane as the trout. But when you're going to, you can't strip it in, you can't pull it in. Remember, you've barely made a cast. All you've done is just roll the leader in about four or five feet of line out into the into the edge of the margins. 
let it sink to the bottom, and then when it's slightly below what you think is the jaw level of the of the fish, try and keep about two feet in front of it. You raise it up and down, jiggling it up and down. If you just shake your wrist like you're really nervous or something, you expect you've got a tax bill coming through the post, start jiggling and nervous. That'll make that fly pulsate, make the hackles or the uh, the body work on it, you know, just just vibrate. And I find that's a pretty deadly method. In fact, I'd say I could catch probably on on some of the on the waters. I would say I bet that's eighty percent of my fishing is is spotting a big fish that's resting or cruising very slowly and happily close to the margins or a piece of structure or a weed bed or an overhanging tree, willow tree, and drop that fly about two feet in front of it, slightly below there. They're playing their swimming up, and then you're jiggling it upwards in about sort of a three or four inch movement just up and down, up and down, up and down, and gradually draw it away from the trout. It's trying to imitate, well, I'm trying to imitate some of the flies we've got, imitate absolutely nothing at all. They look like they come out of the X-Files, but I can assure you they work. It's taking the fly away. You know, so it's a nymph or something hatching and coming up. There's no point in using, I think, something that's an exact match. A lot of purist anglers say, oh, you've, you've got to match the hatch. Well, why would you possibly match the hatch in a water where the trout have been stopped the day before. If you're going to match the hatch, you're going to take the fly off and put a trout pellet on, which of course is against the rules. The fish are fed pellets, let's say it's a, a three-year-old fish, for three years. It's never seen a fly, nothing goes in that water. If a fly goes in the water, it's got three or four thousand other trout to eat it. The chances of it seeing a fly is almost, well, it is zero as far as I'm concerned. So what you're trying to do is induce a take, and that's why... If I'm doing one that's vertical, that's sinking or taking away, I don't want to do it fast because the, the fish are pre-programmed to an item of food moving through the water at such a speed, i.e. a sinking pellet. And I try to imitate that, that speed if I can. That's the way you get a sort of induced take from a trout. What I do is that once I've got that fly, once I get the fly within that two feet zone in front of the fish and you're jiggling it up and down, you have to do this flicking your eyes between fly fish, fly fish, fly fish. And what I'm looking for, I want to know exactly where that fly is, because I'm jiggling it up and down before I take it away from him, and I want to know the reaction of that fish. Now, if you, you've you got this gin clear water, you can see what I call the body language of that trout. You can see the fins sort of bristle, become agitated. Uh, you can sometimes, you're that close, you can see the eye flick where it's seen your fly, and it's going, now is this something I can bite or not? And that's what you want to look for. As you see those fins agitate, so you start to gently raise the rod top, in, you know, imparting some sort of vibrating factor down through the rod, through the line to the fly. As far as I'm concerned, that flicks some Neanderthal switch in that fish that they've had from years ago that probably is still in there genetically, even though they're artificially fed, and it makes him swim over and grab it. Now... They do this really quickly. They suck that in, they feel this, and they blow it out again. They're, they're stupid, but they ain't that stupid. So you need to see the white of the mouth open and shut. You're watching the fish breathing, but as he swims towards you, if you concentrate not on the fly on the fish, you're going to see the white mouth snap twice. First time is the snap. It sucks it in. It has it for like a second if you're lucky. The second white mouth flash is as it blows it out. It's good night, Vienna. You've missed the fish, and it may not take again. So you've got to perfect that that technique of seeing the trout's mouth actually physically snap to close around the fly. It's not something that you can really teach somebody and tell them. You've got to have them there next to you with the rod in their hand so they physically get used to watching the reaction of the trout. Now, the other point is, it's an absolute minefield as to what fly to use. For me, and I, I, I suspect a lot of other people doing stalking big trout, it's not difficult. You use a fly that you generally caught the trout on the previous trip. I'm the same as anybody else. I've got at least, what, one, two, three, I've got four fly boxes with what appears to be nine buttery gars in there, most of which don't catch anything. It's just full of fur, feathers and wool. And for some reason, us fishermen love collecting flies. You know, they're colourful. They might work one day. That's the big thing. They might work. But when you get to stalking, you can you can try different patterns. You realise that a whole bunch of them just don't get the depth. They just don't what we call depth charge down fast enough. Because for big trout, you've got to be pumping that fly in that fish's face as many times you, as you can without spooking it. You know, present, 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 present well and try and induce that take out of the fish. I was actually taught, I mean, I've, I've done lots of trout fishing for well, 30, 35 years 
but I was actually taught this, what I would call a defined technique of stalking by, by three anglers. Um, one was a guy from Kent who was possibly the best stalker I ever saw. Another guy was Jerry Rothman of Hampshire who was a river test angler and obviously was an excellent caster. He taught me how to, you know, to, to watch the fish. Another guy was called Clive. He was uh, first class at getting big fish as well. So I had three very good teachers. I had been fly fishing, but I, I did adapt quickly and I learned, you know, what they told me was get that fly down. Now, of all the flies in my fly box, if I had to choose three flies, and that would be really, really simple, I would probably start the day with a white chomper about, oh, size 12, something like that. But I get them tied by Sid Knight because underneath the dressing, Sid can put extra lead for me. I want as much lead. A lot of the shop bought flies you'll buy would have a fine lead wire ribbing around the outside, you know, of the dress. And it's just to get the fly down below the surface. What we're looking at is getting a fly down four feet. Now, a lot of flies won't go down that fast in time. So you're going to have to either wrap lead wire around the outside of the dressing or you ask your own fly dresser, look, can you tie me some of these flies up? I want the standard patterns like a white jumper, but you want extra lead under the body to get it down. That one I would start with for general medium casting. You know, you're searching the lake, you're, you're casting at a few fish, you're sort of sounding out the start of the day. Later in the day when thing gets tough, with the big fish they start to slow down. Aren't they? A bit spooky in the mornings, they start to slow down, they're swimming slower. If you put a big fly in there, you'll just wind them up. They've seen a lot of anglers' flies, they're pretty well wised up. You've got to go small. You go down to a size 14 when all else fails. W-A-E-F, they are in the uh, in the catalogs. It's called a waif. And it's a tiny little, well, it's really almost like the bare hook nymph. Tiny little, like almost like a buzzer. I would describe it as a buzzer. It's never going to hatch out. It's just lead and a tiny little bit of tinsel with it. Uh, they're deadly. They sink very, very fast because they don't have the body dressing to slow up that sink drift. If you have too much bulky body dressing, you can have lead there, but the dressing and the hackles of the fly stop it going down fast enough. So that's a sort of no-no. So that would be my second choice. Then later in the afternoon, well, it's about the most deadly fly I designed specifically for fishing in close on vertical plane fishing. It's a pig to cast. Don't get hit around the back of the head for it because it, it, it's got a big lead weight in the front of it. Sid Knight ties them. It's called a firebird, and you can get that in a 10 or an 8. I like to use a wide gape hook on that because if you have too big a bead on the head, it sort of, I think it detracts and bounces out of the fish. Sometimes you can bounce them off. So I like a wide gape hook. So there's always a point of the hook is showing well clear of the head. Um, this has a, it's, it's nothing on God's earth ever looks like this. Things like a Christmas tree upside down. You drop it down. It can go right to the bottom. It sinks like a stone and you pulsate it up off the bottom, get it in front of a big trout. I just jiggle that rod, and I mean, they just, they will either spook and swim out to the next lake or up the A35, they're so terrified of it, or more often than not, they just rush straight over and gorge themselves on it, and you have to take the fly out with a pair of forceps, they got it so far back. That would be my choice of three. Well, that certainly takes care of what you tie on the end of your leader and how to employ it. But what about the leader itself? Specifically for this type of fishing, which as you've said is often done at very short range, do you go for a straight or a tapered leader? Well, because a lot of the fishing is, is close in fishing, and it's what I call from rolling the line out on the bank edge to casting, let's say, 15 yards, which is not a long cast, I just use straight mono, just a straight five or six pound uh, test regular fishing line, you know, just a smaller line. And I don't use long leaders for this fishing. Uh, they tend to collapse if you do have to cast with a heavy weight of lead you got on the fly. What you do is... Nine feet, if you've got a nine feet rod, I want to go to about a ten feet leader. So that when I'm walking, the fly is constantly pinched between my left fingers. I'm ready to roll cast straight out onto a fish. I don't have to unclip the fly, start force casting, anything like that. If you're casting any longer than about 15 yards, you want a tapered leader. Otherwise, as you're casting with a heavily weighted nymph, you'll find the leader will collapse into the wind, especially as a problem. Even if you're a good caster, the fly line will go out and you'll end up with a crumpled heap and that's not a good presentation to the fish. So a tapered light leader does in fact unroll much better. So you might have to change leaders if you start seeing fish way out in the lake. Um, hopefully you're going to see them close in and you can get them on that horizontal plane, you know, 15 yards, or you can get them almost virtually under your rod tip up and down. 
Uh, so five, six pounds. A lot of fisheries don't let you use less than six pounds. You might want to go to fluorocarbon if they, you know if that's your ilk. If you want that and think, oh, they can they can see the leader. Personally, I don't think I'd worry too much about them seeing the leader. What you do want, you want it to go down, as I've specified, fast. And for that, you want to degrease it. You can either buy a propriety brand of uh, you know degreasant for the leader. I personally just use washing up liquid, a little drum of washing up liquid. That's all you need every. 10, 15 minutes, you smear it up and down. I even put it over the fly just to help, the, you know, if there's any dress in there, it breaks through the surface film, boom, straight down in front of the fish. So degrease a leader, long distance casting or medium, you don't really need long distance casting. You're not going to see a trout's mouth open and close at 30 yards. I don't care if you've got bionic vision, it's not going to happen. You're going to miss the fish. You might luck into it. You might just be stripping in and pulling blind and, and get lucky on the strike, see the fish follow and, and, and not see the mouth go. But you just, you're banking on normal standard trout and obviously, you know, the smaller fish will rush in front of a big one and grab it. We've all had that, which is quite frustrating. So, you know, tapered leaders only for over about 15 yards, that's all I can say. And what sort of big fish success rates have you enjoyed doing this? I would say I probably, this is, this, this is how good stalking is. In my early years of trouting, I realised some of the fisheries had some big fish in there, and I thought you just lucked into them. I think I had a fish of 10 and a quarter pound blind casting. That's one double-figure fish over years. I met up with these guys at Diva Springs, it was, um, doing a, a press story on them and on the fishery there. Uh, it was Jerry Rothman and Clive and Andy. They were they were all pals going around together. Well, the, the three of them together, if you put them on Abington or Diva, any of the Clearwater Chalk Springs, the top places, they're 100% they're going to catch fish, especially Andy. He was unbelievable. I'm talking big fish. Uh, my fish with Jerry and went to Abington and covered a story with him, and he broke the four-fish limit record there. I think he had, off the top of my head, four fish for 84 or 80 pounds. So you're looking at four 20-pound rainbows by one man in one day, and he's using light tackle, not big nine weights. He's using seven weights, six weights. I've even seen them use four weights, and I think I saw one of the three of them use a double-figure fish on a two-weight, can you believe? It was unbelievable fishing wand. Myself, I've had three 20-pounders, or up to 22 I've had quite a few doubles up to 18, and it just escalated. I'm telling you, the weekend after I met the three of them, I had, an, I think it was an 18-6 from Diva, and then I had another 16 from Diva as well. So, I mean, because I could catch trout, and I was pretty good at spotting fish anyway, it was just a question of, well, I'd seen the fish, but I didn't think I could catch them. Yes, you can catch them, providing you use this technique. OK, so there are only a small number of potentially good, gin-clear, spring-fed trout waters where stalking is possible, and where the fishery staff are willing to cater for anglers wanting very big fish which they can pursue in this way. Equally, those anglers will also know that there can only ever be a small number of big fish in there at any given time for them to stalk. All the right ingredients then necessary to bring out the very worst in terms of ungentlemanly behaviour. So just how competitive actually could it be? Well, in the early days, I mean, I'll be talking, say, 15 years ago, something like that. It was extremely, it was very, very competitive because there was only a limited number of fish over £10 stock then. You know, there, there's, there's still a fairly limited number of big fish going in in proportion to the number of other fish that are in there, the stock fish and the proportion of anglers fishing for them. But as it got popularised, the art of stalking and the fish got bigger and they got reported, more and more what I would call ordinary trout anglers realised, hey, you know, actually this technique does work. And your worst fear as a stalker, really, was not uh, seeing people... You could have ten people on one lake, all flailing away, standing in the same spot, no Polaroids, uh, casting out, stripping back, casting out, stripping back. That's fine. They're absolutely no threat at all. They might luck into one fish. They might they might get lucky and get, uh, get a blind strike. But your worst fear was spotting a guy bypassing all those, walking around the edge of the rushes, peeping over rushes, looking in the corners, looking under trees, walking really slowly, stealthily, you know. He might look like a, a car thief or something, but you knew he was looking for the same fish you were looking for. So as long as you got a hat, you know, like a long peak hat and a pair of polarising glasses, you know, you'd all look like stalkers, but it was the mannerism of the stalker which you thought... Holy cow, has he seen the fish I saw just now in the corner? If he's missed it, I can go around and catch it. Has he seen the one that I'm casting at now? Now, there was one little trick I developed, really, because I, 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 I soon twigged that if somebody else knew I was going around stalking, as I'm stripping off, just to, I'm stripping off not my clothes, I'm stripping off lying off the fly reel to make the cast, 
the real squawk in a way. Yeah, rah, rah, rah. Away goes the real your squawk in a way there. Obviously, the guy's going to look up. Why is that guy over there? Why is that guy stalking? Why is he casting? He's seen something. So I've effectively, by pulling line off the reel, told another stalker, there's a big fish here. I've just spotted something worth casting for. Because don't forget, I told you, the stalking people don't make any casts. They're looking and looking and looking. They don't cast till they see the fish they want. So I sort of give my position away, and I sussed that out after a while, after people then followed me around, I moved off, and they moved in and caught the 15-pounder. You think, great, I just told them where the fish was. So what I did is I, I took the inside of the reel out, and I took both my little ratchet uh, uh, cogs off the inside of the reel, and I have it on silent, specifically for that one reason, that I can strip line out fast, get the fly line in the water, nobody even knows I'm casting at a fish, and... Uh, the the upside of it is, if the fish strips lying out, you don't hear the ratchet go either. They don't really know a got a fish that's on the bank. At one stage, it used to get so bad uh, with so many people stalking, because don't forget, you could go to places like, I suppose the premier place was Abington in the very, very early days, when they had the uh, the grown-on Shasta rainbows. The Shasta rainbow was the original strain that they imported in, and they absolutely incredible fighting fish. You'd hook a, hook a six-pound Shasta, or Shasta-based rainbow, and I mean it, a take off like a steelhead. It would be out the water, it would strip half your fly line out. Now, you don't get that now with the trout. They just, I suppose that fighting quality has been bred out from quite a bit. And they, you know, they flop around and tug a bit. They're good sport, they're entertainment, but they, trust me, they're not steelhead and they're not shasters. But you get a guy that would, he would see, he would see you casting or stopping to look at a fish, but he would also know by your body language which way you're going, you know, which way you're casting at that fish. And he'd try and come around the other side and cut you off. So if there was anglers in between, let's say, I'm coming around one side of the lake, he's coming around the other side of the lake, the fish is cruising along, I've got to stop casting sooner or later, because out of courtesy to other fly fishermen, you don't want to be within, say, 10 yards, 15 yards of their fishing, I've got to stop casting, he's going to pick that fish up when it swims past the other guy, and he's going to start casting at it. So, you know, a lot of the time was not giving your body language away and trying to target that fish. It was it was pretty frantic, exciting fishing. The, I mean, we went, two or three of us used to go down. We'd go to Abington in the early days, and I think the kickoff was nine o'clock. Everybody would be pulled in the car park. Everybody would be politely, nervously chatting, pretending it was all... It was all cool. It was going to be a wonderful, relaxing day trout fishing. And we all knew from the stalkers that were there, the ordinary guys turned up. They were happy as Larry. You know, it's just a day's fishing, that fantastic fishing, fishery spot. But bearing in mind, the British record was getting broken, you know, month after month sometimes, virtually, you know, with, with people breaking it, you know, 10 pound, 10, 6, 11, 11, 14. Um, word got around of which fisheries were uh, producing these fish. So the excitement factor was high. One of my friends was, I remember one day he'd heard that the, there was three doubles going in, what we used to call the inlet, you know, for press purposes. So they booked the day after the press had been in there and hoped the press couldn't catch a fish and they'd have a shot at it as well. And he was physically sick. The guy was physically sick in the morning, about seven o'clock in the morning, just outside the car. Another time I remember we were so excited, the late Sam Holland, he opened the, we used to be a five bar gate there, he opened the gate. And, and this is no word of a lie, some of us used to run down there, and I was one, and I had a fly box, a pretty expensive dry fly box, drop out my pocket, it hit the gravel drive, and a guy shouted, hey man, you know, just drop your fly box, and I said, it's okay, I'll pick it up later. I couldn't afford, I couldn't afford to stop, because there were three or four other stalkers in front of me, running down the fishery, to be the first to cast out of that fish. I did indeed get the fly box, thought, thankfully somebody, I would have probably valued it at 50 pounds with the flies in there plus the box but as far as i was concerned the chance to get that record trout was was too strong and the ego was on fire as well you know the, the thought of seeing a blaze of publicity like all the stalkers wanted to break that record and i thought i've got to be up there you've got to be in it to win it that's the saying didn't break the record but i've had some good fish out of it this is i'm only telling you phil a personal friend it's never been told before i've never written about this one because to me as a stalker this is, this is very, very important. Only a, a couple of my best friends, Adrian Hutchins, a couple of other guys know it. And they use it and, it, and to good effect they use it. These trout, when they're fed, I've already said they're fairly dumb creatures. They're fed for like three or four years. At the same time, the same size pellet as they get bigger. So they're pre-programmed to something at a set sinking speed going through the water. But it's the time, it's the time. So if I'm going to one of these fisheries, or indeed a new one, I'll ask the fishery guy... Not necessarily the manager, but the guy who does the fish feeding, what times he feeds those trout at. 
So let's say he feeds the trout out, for example, 11 o'clock in the morning when he's got rid of all the anglers and he's done his day tickets, and then he might give them their second feed at 5 in the afternoon. I know when those trout are pre-programmed to feed. So we used to go down, fish away as normal, but if we had a big fish that we just could not get to take, we rested it, we, le- we left it alone, and then we targeted it, you know, as hard as we could put as many presentations as we could around that feeding period, i.e. it could have been 11 o'clock in the morning, and then we'd rest it again if we didn't get the take, and we'd do it again at, say, 5 in the afternoon. So that would increase our chances hugely of that trout being pre-programmed over five years. Imagine you're fed, for you know, every day, the same food, not just a different dinner, the same food at the same time at the same place. There's a fair chance if something falls in front of your face between five, five o'clock and six o'clock, whenever you've been, you know, fed for five years, you're probably going to, you're probably going to eat it, you know. And that's what we found. That was one of the specialist techniques. And if you, you go to any fishery, all you got to do is ask the fishery guys when the fish feed. And hopefully if the other anglers haven't done it, you know, you've got a, a big percentage increase in stalking and a chance of presenting your fly at the time when that big giant trout is more programmed to eat. Sounds a bit like the Pavlov's dog experiment, where he had them so conditioned in the feeding that he only had to sound the dinner bell to have them salivating in anticipation. With that in mind, do you have any other little tips or hints? Yeah, another tip we used to use, I mean, you, you, you need all the pointers in your favour, you see. This is a thing because there's a lot of other, what should we call them, we call them big names in the angling world that wanted to get those record fish. And I was just Joe Pleb with me and my friends, you know, and we were just trout fishermen. Um, unfortunately, we're, we were quite good at course fishing, so you applied that approach and technique towards trout from the course fishing, the barbel, the chub, the carp, the visual fishing we've done, and it didn't take, you know, too much trouble to drop into the trout mode and realise, you know, that these trout actually can be caught. Another little tip you want to look for is on put-and-take fisheries, uh, because the trout are taken out, they're caught and killed by anglers, they have a, a no-returns policy, if the fish are taken out, there's nothing for the guys the next day, or very few. So the fishery's got to stock them again. So I want to know, not only what time do they feed them at, but where do they stock them? Oh, no, no anglers are going to hear that, are they? You know, that's, uh, why would they tell the anglers we're going to... I mean, in America, they have anglers running and driving after the big stocking trucks to stock the reservoirs, and, and I think they're almost casting up the back of the stocking truck, from what I've gathered. But, you know, it is America, after all. But it's pretty much the same over here, so... What we used to do, we'd, we'd know there were stocks, certain lakes were done by netting, so you'd look for drag marks in the wet grass as to, you know, where the fish have been netted out and dragged to, or if they go around in a truck, the truck's going to stop. Well, two things are going to happen. They're going to probably stock in the same place, so because they're carrying, I don't know, a ton of water or more, and fish as well, it's going to sink in the ground. Also, there's going to be a lot of water slopped out as they net the fish out, runs down the back of the truck, sits in the little hollows that were left by the wheel, wheel marks. So we look for those as well. Uh, Arrington in the early days, well, it was no secret. It was every, all these fish were stocked at what we call the inlet. It's sort of pretty silted up now at the moment, but all the big fish were stocked in the inlet. And we believe that they, they, the trout thought that the inlet size was pretty much the same size as their stock pond. So they sw- swim round and round in circles, what I'm trying to say. Uh, never really went, even went out in the, in the main lake. So the prime spots, a lot of the big names used to fish there would be just at the mouth of the inlet, either side, waiting for the fish to come past them. So, you know, not difficult, but a tiny tip that an ordinary angler wouldn't think of, just look for the stocking trap marks. Bit of a cheat, but it might get you that big fish. Let's talk a little bit now about stalking big browns. Yeah, well, brown trout, now, although they can be fed on, I can't say why, the fishery managers can't say why, nobody can really say why, but they are a totally different ball game catching brown trout, big brown trout, than big rainbows. I'm not sure why this is. I, th- I personally like to think there's some genetic throwback, or maybe they're more used to being careful, you know, they're original. Don't forget the rainbow is an imported fish, it was never indigenous to the UK anyway. The brown trout was our traditional fish. And I just like to think, well, it's a brown trout, it's English or British, as you say. It's better, it's more intelligent, it's more clever. But to be honest, they really are tough to catch. A lot of fishery managers, because they're slower growing, they take more feed to get them up into double figures. So they're they're expensive to stock, you know. You're not going to get a lot of big browns going in. I've seen my guys uh, stalking, catching them up to, I think, the biggest I, I saw hooked up, and I photographed was about 15 pounds, six out of Diva. Diva had... 
In fact, it's still got the the brown trout record. I think it's up around twenty eight pounds. It's like colossal fish. Even now, this is as we as we're talking. We were uh, uh, doing an interview with a fishery manager there. So from the last 10, 15 years that I know of, they stock brown trout in there. They just don't come out really the same day. They're really tough to catch. They stay deeper. They like the cold water of a spring. They will start feeding on the insects faster than the rainbows. Although they've been fed on pellets, you'd like to say all trout are dumb. Well, brown trout, for some reason, they just do not react the same. So as far as stalking goes... Catching big rainbows is one thing, but go and talk to the guy that's had about 10 double-figure browns, and he's worth buying a beer for, I'm telling you, because not many people have had big ones. How devious, then, must you become to be a consistently good stalker and maintain your edge over the competition? Well, I suppose you could say devious, but you definitely, definitely got to get the edge on the other stalkers. Two anecdotes, right? Abington, early days, want to know where the stocking truck is, you can't see it, so you get a pal to go back. One would be on the gate for the open. You know, you had to go up at nine o'clock for the open. The other guy would be down on the bridge at the bottom end. Probably the fishery people don't even know this. He used to be down at the bottom end of the fishery by the bridge over there carry us to a pair of binoculars. He knows where the, where the fish are gone and he's seen where they've been stocked. Of course, he's not down on the gate. He's not bothered because they used to have a bottom entrance in those days. So provided he wasn't on the fishery before nine o'clock, he was fine. And providing he got a ticket, so his friend would buy two tickets, one for him, one for the other guy. The guy on the bridge then gets straight in through the bottom, what used to be the bottom fence down, this closed off now. He gets straight to, say, the bottom of the third lake, as we called it, and he gets first shot at any of those double-figure fish. It's, it's all legal, it's all perfectly legal, it's changed now, but that was the advantage would, you'd, you'd have over one of the other guys. We didn't you'd, used to do it. We used to run like idiots from uh, the main car park until we sussed out... Why is that old guy always down there with the binoculars, like a five to nine? Um, and that's what it was. So that was, uh, was was one of the things. Another thing you do, if you had a double figure trout and you want to go looking for another one, you either put it in the rushes with a with a with a clip on it, you know, to keep it cool, but mostly keep it out of sight. Or if you're carrying with it, you know, you're carrying it along. You you didn't generally want to get it weighed unless it's really huge. You're carrying it around. You know that another stalker is probably going to come up to you and ask, you know, what fly you caught it on. So if you've clipped your fly into the bottom where the blank is on the cork or one of those little retaining rings, as you're walking along, you'd turn that rod around and put your hand over that ring of the fly. He comes up to you and asks, what fly did you get? It's a nice fish. What fly did you get it on? You take out a totally different pattern and, and hopefully an unweighted one from your lapel where you had the little sheep's wool where you put the tag of your flies in there and show them the exact opposite colour. I mean, the last thing you want to do is give away any, any trade secrets, if you like, to another stalker that's going to go and catch that alleged British record in front of you. So what then, in your view, is the future for stalking and stalking waters? And how, if at all, have things changed from when you first started? Less competitive now, I would say. I would think probably almost primarily the main thing is because the British record now is sort of almost out of sight. Certainly for the rainbows, it's over 30 pounds. For the brown, it's over 28 pounds. Don't forget, we were fishing in an era after Sam Holland of Avington fame really opened a can of worms by growing big trout. He was the forerunner. He was the pioneer of the fish farming and the big fish scene as we know it today. It was controversial then. It was controversial now. But anglers like catching big fish. You can't blame them. That's you know what fishing is all about, really is uh, anglers want to catch a nice big fish. How is it going now? It's nothing like it used to be, because there's not that burning desire. I've got to tell you, if there was a 35-pounder stocked, and I knew about it, I would probably, even at my age, get out the Zimmer frame, oil the wheels, and I'd be running down after it again. I dare say I would be, in all honesty. But it's not the same as it was. You know, there's less anglers around. Don't forget the fishery managers. Now the cost of fish food's gone up. Is you know, pretty astronomical. The cost of running the fishery, the guy's wages, everything's going up uh, with inflation, so they're going to possibly put less fish in there. So not so many big fish around. Having said that, I was very, very lucky recently, uh, just before we did this, to get one of 15, 10, ironically on a firebird, you know, fishing vertically at Diva Spring. So, I mean, it's still there. The fish are still there to be caught. The competitive nature between the stalkers, I don't think, is there. I don't think there's so many people doing it now. I don't see so many people on the fisheries that uh, are competitive as, as they were. You know, there are people going around stalking, they're all looking for the bigger fish. But it doesn't have the same kudos, you know, really, the fact you've 
you've had so many double figures. I mean, one of the guys I know, I think he had 28 doubles and eight twenties. I mean, phenomenal fishing in the time. Some of the good guys were really, really good at what they did. Of course, you know, you can ask yourself, are we ever going to see fish of that size again? You know, like 28 pound browns and 30 pound plus rainbows. I guess sooner or later, somebody's going to uh, produce a jumbo fish again. They're going to find a, a genetic strain that will bomb well to uh, perhaps a new feed or a new way of keeping them. Um, like Nigel Jackson of Diva Springs fame, you know, he, he, he's the one that's grown the really monster trout. Whether somebody else will move on from uh, him and start it again, I don't know. I think what people have got to do now is reassess what is a good fish. I mean, the people of, of, of my era, you know, 20 years ago, we moved up from the, from the 10 pound was a good fish, 12 pound was a good fish, 14 pounds is a monster fish. That's not so, you know, in the last, say, eight years, it's got up to 30 and almost close to 30 for the Browns. I don't ever think those giant fish will come again for a number of years. You've got the recession, you've got uh, economic cash flow problems, people can't afford to have so many days fishing, they can't pursue the fish like they used to. So reassess it. Still do the uh, stalking. It's still a deadly technique for getting big fish. Now that big fish could still be, say, a six-pound trout in a water that's stocked with mainly two-pound trout. So you have to get uh, get your fish in perspective. And I think maybe go back to the beginning and think a 10- to 12-pound fish is still a really good fish on the day. And if you get from the, let's say, 15 to 18s, that's brilliant. That's a, that's a huge fish. Once you get just over the 20, they really are getting to be a fish of a lifetime now. Uh, the technique works. There's no, there's no question the technique works because some of these people who have caught the double figure fish, when you get to talk to them, they've got huge numbers of fish and the picture to back them up. I've fished with them. I've, I, I know how good they are, some of these guys. They're very, very good at what they do and they have had the experience. So there's no question stalking is a technique that works for the really big rainbow trout. I'll, I'll give you an illustration of, of just how not stupid the trout are, but how gullible, particularly rainbow trout are. Many, many years ago, this has got to be 30 years ago, they operated a, a, a sort of catch and release policy. I think it was at Damrum, down at Damrum they did it with small fish, a couple of pounds, pound, pound and a quarter, pound and a half, you know, good light tackle fish. And we went down there and we did several sessions there. And uh, we were sitting one lunchtime, I think we'd had by lunchtime, this is how easy it was, 27 trout on the fly. And we were just sitting having lunch at the bottom of the first lake by the car park, talking away. Along comes the trout, we're all munching away. One of the guys says, do you know, that's so stupid, these fish, I reckon they'd take my ham sandwich. And he took a piece of ham sandwich, we must all have done it at some stage or other, rolled it up in a ball, threw it out, the trout swam past, came straight back, we saw the mouth flash, the bread went. I was eating a piece of currant cake, I broke a piece of currant cake off, I tossed it in, we jokingly said, a pound says that fish won't turn around again. It turned around, it ate the currant cake. I'm a fowl had a banana, and we, we did draw the line and put the skin in there. He tossed a piece of banana in. It took a piece of banana. And we just realised, hang on, we thought we'd had a good day fly fishing. It's a damn good job they made us fish with fly. We caught 27 on the fly. How many could have we caught on banana, currant cake, and bread? Now, having said that uh, the big fish scene won't come back on the rainbows, uh, maybe the browns, I'll tell you something that might come back. It was something I have mentioned before. was at one stage, I don't know what it was, about 10 years ago, I think it was Wilf Welsh at Hazel Copse set the world alight by introducing stillwater salmon brought all the way down from, from Scotland. You don't know, there was absolute uproar about these uh, salmon going in. It wasn't right, you know, shouldn't be done. But a lot of anglers turned up and wanted to catch them. There were some big fish, I think there were 20-pounders caught. And I went there one day with Jerry Rothman, and um, we dropped in, this is at Sussex, and thought, well, I wonder if you can spot these salmon, you know. And do you know what? It was exactly like fishing for the big rainbows. And we went stalking, following salmon around the edge. And eventually I got my first stillwater salmon. And it was an absolute clonker. It was 16 pounds. So as far as I'm concerned, if they want to put stillwater salmon in, I'm quite happy to go stalking for them. I take it then that these salmon are Atlantic salmon, which are an indigenous species, unlike the rainbow trout. So how do the so-called purists manage to balance that particular dilemma? I think there is some word possibly one of the main fisheries is going to start trying to introduce giant salmon again. If they do that, I think that will be a whole new 
boost for the stalking and fly fishing fraternity. There's obviously going to be uproar about it. The purists are going to say it shouldn't be done, blah, blah, blah. But I can assure you, if they start putting in 16-pound salmon and 20-pound salmon into a still water, and they can easily do that up in Scotland and, and these sea fish farms, they're growing immense fish very quickly. If you see a, uh, you know, one of these silver salmon swimming about 20 pounds is going in front of you, don't tell me you don't want to catch it. We all want to catch it. They're superb fish. And I think that could be a boost for the future. So, in effect, it might be that the still water salmon are actually going to take over from the big giant trout. If they do, expect to see me. If you see one creeping around the bushes, an angler, it could be me. Actually, when we were at Diva Springs yesterday, Stuart Barrett hinted that they too were thinking about salmon for the future, as well as maybe having another go at growing on some seriously big browns. Well, I think it's the fact that they, they don't like them in, in you know, they, it's probably because they can hardly catch many salmon in the rivers now because they're depleted so much, and obviously we have to supplement whatever stock we've taken naturally by the ones we're, we're growing on. You know, these stock rainbow trout actually is a supply and demand, you know, the anglers want to catch trout, they can't possibly survive under normal conditions eating food and grow big. You know, a wild trout, let's say a two pound, three pound brown trout in a river is about the sort of size limit you're going to get. Nat natural food is eating insects. So you're going to always, always need to supply the angles with fish. And if they want to pay the money to catch these giant salmon, you know, why shouldn't they? It's, uh, it's a fabulous fish to catch. And after all, these are fish that are, are what you would generally call table fish anyway. So what's the difference? You know, they're grown on in a fish farm. You either see them up on a supermarket slab or you see them swimming around in the lakes. So I sooner see them swimming in the lakes and you've got a chance of catching one and eating it. Having already done a couple of stalking videos with you, both of which are on the website, there can be absolutely no doubt about its effectiveness at picking out individual fish, particularly the jiggling which is real adrenaline pumping edge of the seat stuff. My thanks then to Graham for sharing his stalking expertise along with some of his stalking memories here with us. Mm -hmm.